Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and this is a very frisky Shackleton. Not sure uh, what catnip he's got into lately, but he's uh, all over me. Anyway, I want to talk about something in the climate system that I've talked about quite a bit before, but it's crucially vitally important, and that's the jet streams, the behavior of the jet streams. Okay, for many, many years I've been saying that the jet streams have been slowing down and getting wavier because of Arctic temperature amplification. The Arctic is warming so much faster than the rest of the planet that it's decreased the temperature gradient to the equator, which has slowed down the jet streams. Thus they've become much wavier and they often get stuck. The jet stream position is also limited. There's limitations on where it can be on this on the surface of the earth because of the orography or the the mountain ranges and things you know the jet stream comes up very high mountains got to go either north of it or south of it it goes north of it so let's take the rockies for example in the u.s on the uh you know interior western coast western uh, part of the u.s so the jet streams go north above the rockies and then they dip down over the uh, middle part of the country so the left side of the U.S. is under a strong ridge. They dip down far, and the east side is under a um, trough. So under the ridge, we get drought. We get very, very little rainfall, very hot temperatures. On the east coast, we can get lots of precipitation. So this is a common, con common sort of pattern. Uh, the orography or the terrain sets up the position and then the waves are amplified by something called quasi-resonant amplification according to a recent paper by Michael Mann which came out I believe at the end of October and then um, was talked about at the American Geophysical Union conference that just uh, that happened in Washington and ended just last week. So I'm going to talk all about these features you know what the latest uh, scientific research says on the jet streams getting stuck and I'll talk about the implications of this. So when we're talking about jet streams, anytime we're talking about jet streams, just Google Earth Null School and click on Earth and go to 250 millibar, which is the elevation, the pressure at the altitude that the jet streams are at. Click on Earth again and we have a view here of the North Pole is sitting right up here. Greenland's here. North, uh, North America's here. This is what you see right now. You get these troughs and you get these uh, ridges coming up. So the ridges go right up into the, as, as far as the North Pole in the middle of winter. Complete darkness brings up warm air. You can get huge temperature anomalies, 20, 25, 30 degrees Celsius, warmer than normal. The troughs can extend far south. And the problem is, is when these patterns get stuck in place, then you get persistent weather events. So I want to point out that to find scientific papers, more and more of them are not behind paywalls. They're what's called open source. Um, and you could actually access the, the whole paper. So I just went into, I Googled Google Scholar and opened up Google Scholar. And this is a focus on scientific papers. So I searched for jet streams and this came up. Now, um, you can sort by relevance or you can sort by date. So if I sorted by date, so this was released eight days ago, 10 days ago, and so on. So you get really recent stuff. If you're sorting by relevance, you often want to go since 2018, for example, just to get the most recent papers. And you can scroll through and you can find the paper, you know, find, you know, how much information is being published on a specific talk, topic that you want to look at. Now, I know this paper was by Michael Mann. He was one of the authors. So I went to his website. I know it was published around the end of October. So here we go. Weather to become more extreme as the jet stream changes. Uh, when the jet stream resonates, expect trouble. So clicking on any of these articles and then the link to the paper and you can get this. And this is open source. So projected changes in persistent extreme summer weather events, the role of quasi-resonant amplification. So I've got the paper. 
Now, what I say about these papers is you want to look at the abstract. Okay, so what was determined in this paper? You want to look at the abstract, the conclusions, and the figures. Okay, so it's talking about extreme weather in the northern hemisphere summer being associated with high amplitude. So this is in the north-south direction. This is meridional waves, very high ridges going far north, troughs going far south, quasi-stationary. So these are persistent patterns. They're not permanently stationary, but they're quasi-stationary. You might get locked into a pattern for a few days or a week or even up to a month in some cases. These are atmospheric Rossby waves. These are the jet streams. These are planetary waves that circumvent the Earth in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. You have a polar jet, and then you have a subpolar jet, generally two jet streams, at, uh, one at high latitude, one at lower latitude, circumventing the Earth both in the northern and southern hemisphere. Zonal, that means west to east. Zonal wave numbers six to eight. So that means that the patterns that we're getting, these quasi-resonant amplification patterns of the jet stream, where it gets locked into certain positions or configurations, have they repeat six to eight times in the northern hemisphere. So that means ridge trough, ridge trough, ridge trough, okay, repeated six times. Um, and how do you measure these things? Well, one of the things you can do is look at the temperature. In the ridges, the temperatures are higher. In the troughs, they're lower. So you can look at the zonally, so that's from west to east, average surface temperature field. And you can find temperatures high. That'll be a ridge, low trough, high ridge, low trough, etc. Okay, so you can, you can find that these events exist. Now, if you want to see what happens in the future, how will these changes, climate change, proceeds, you can look at the climate models. And these events are likely to increase by 50% this century under business as usual. Some models showed not a big increase. Other models showed a three times the frequency of occurrence of these, of these stuck weather patterns um, moving forward. So there's considerable variation. Some predict a near tripling of QRA events by the end of the century. Others predict a decrease. Now, I'll talk about the models. I'll talk about why the models, it's so difficult to, to, to get the models to predict these things. Um, also, uh, a key thing is the aerosols. Okay, um, aerosols are produced by industry. It's any, any non-water particulates or droplets in the atmosphere. These things stop some of the sunlight from hitting the earth, generally cause a cooling, something called global dimming. Um, how much is happening is an open question at somewhere from half a degree to maybe one and a half degrees being the most likely range, maybe a full degree. So it's a significant effect. So one, now most of the aerosols are washed out of the atmosphere within about a week. So they're produced at mid-latitude. They go from west to east. They're picked up by the prevailing wind patterns, depending on where you are. And they're where cities are, industries are. So as we reduce aerosols, as we go off coal, a lot of them are produced from coal-burning plants, like the sulfur dioxides and things like that, sulfur particles coming from coal, incomplete combustion, etc. So as we cut back on coal and cut back on these aerosols, then these are in the mid-latitudes mid, uh, um, mid in the northern hemisphere. So the cooling that is going on there will be obliterated as these, um, depending on what the global dimming factor is, and that will cause a warming mid-latitudes, and that will have some counter effects on the um, an Arctic amplification. So with the Arctic warming, equator not changing too much, mid-latitudes not changing, then we get a decrease in the temperature difference, and the jet streams slow down and become wavier. If we're warming the mid-latitudes, that can increase the temperature difference, so the jet streams can revert back to being a bit stronger and less wavier if the aerosol factor is huge. It's all a matter of timing, right? We're likely to lose sea ice in a few years, so I think the Arctic amplification effect will win out far before we manage to reduce uh, aerosol emissions. Okay, so that's the gist of this paper. Um, I'll talk about a few more details of it, but first I want to start looking at some of the diagrams. So what are some of the results from this paper? Okay, so let me... Um, find a good um, 
magnification here. This might be too much. Okay, so what this does is there, there's um, three events that are looked at. July, August 2003. Okay, this is the European heat wave. So this is Europe here. What we're showing here is the meridional wind speed. So red is up, is south to north. Blue is north to south. So what we see is the wind is moving northward up in this region. So there's a strong ridge forming and then the winds are moving, the jet stream winds are moving to the far south. So we have a strong ridge here and this caused a heat wave in Europe. In July and August, about 70,000 people died, 50,000 of which were in France alone. Okay, now in terms of the, the, the discrete wave number, in the zonal wave number, uh, we've got seven eight nine or six seven eight to nine that sort of thing so this is the wave number of the resonance of the of the waves so we got a ridge winds going up and down a, a ridge winds going up again trough here ridge here okay and so on you can count the pairs one pair two pairs three pairs four pairs five pairs six pairs Six pairs right now circumventing the Earth. So these planetary waves get stuck into this pattern. This lasted a long time, several weeks to a month. And uh, this is what the velocity, U is the zonal velocity. So it shows that it peaks here at two different latitudes, okay? So this is a, a, peak, a double peaking uh, jet stream maximum, if you like, in the zonal direction. Okay, so this is the pattern that got set up and that got stuck was, was um, by the quasi-resonant um, amplification process and it caused basically massive heat wave in Europe, long duration, and a lot of people died. Now, July, August 2010 was another event, but it's similar. You get this discrete wave, you get this locking, if you like, this resonant amplification of the jet streams. This is a pattern here. Again, meridional going up, going down, bridge here, and so on. So this, what this was is this was a heat wave over Moscow and a trough over Pakistan. For It lasted about a month in this time period. Pakistan, three quarters of the country was flooded out. And in Russia, uh, temperatures were over 30, 30 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius for weeks on end. Russia lost about 40% uh, of the grain crop and could not export that year. Uh, grain prices went way up. Arab, Arab Spring was triggered. That was this event. So again, the, the um, zonal wind speed, there's the two peaks again. You can see the wave numbers where things are basically configured and stays there for about a month. This is another event. This is a heat wave in Texas. So here the winds are going up here, um, down here, up here, trough, and ridge over here. So we had massive heat wave in Texas in this time period. This is the uh, information. This is the, the locking of the, um, the, the resonance, locking to the resonance of the Earth. So these waves are, you know, circumventing the Earth with, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine nodes, gets locked into place, and you still get a, a bimodal uh, velocity distribution with, so this is the, the mean zonal velocity around the planet with latitude, and you still have this peak here. Okay. So this is, um, what, what does this show over here? This is the meridional, this is the temperature anomaly that's set up in the meridional direction. This is what the fingerprint looks like with the quasi-resonant amplification. This is the um, Arctic amplification index. So temperatures here, much warmer up in the Arctic when you go up north of about 60 odd, 65 odd degrees. And what we can see here is 2003, the, the pattern, 2010 and 2011. So all of the, there's some variation here, but these events have this, are, are, the values are very high here, corresponding to the quasi-resonant amplification condition. Okay, so I'm going to continue this um, video to talk about